Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to your Lunch Break Live. My name is Ivana, if you're new here, and uh, if you're not, thanks for coming back. Today is Monday, March the 1st, and I have a really special guest, and this is Dr. Suzanne Judd. Now, if you've been with me from the beginning of this pandemic, you might remember Dr. Judd. She has come on this show before and um, has used some of her knowledge to kind of explain things about the virus last year. Now, this year, we have her on for a piece of kind of exciting news. Now, Dr. Judd, Judd released a projection last week that said Alabama could reach herd immunity from coronavirus by May or June. I know that was something that was uh, kind of a music to our ears over the weekend, uh, Dr. Judd, but I know a lot of people have questions about how you've been able to make that projection, uh, how we will know if that pro projection is going to come to fruition, and some other questions about it. So, Thought Monday would be a good day. Let's start with a little bit of good news this week. And let's hear about how we could get to herd immunity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me again, Ivana. It's great to be here. So basically what we took a look at is some new data that UAB released and Columbia University released. And this data shows that there are more people that have had SARS-CoV-2 infection and developed immunity or antibodies than we realized. The Columbia study estimates that as many as 10 times uh, the number of people of cases we've identified have actually developed immunity to the virus, indicating either a low level infection or they just weren't able to get tested. Our own data at UAB, which are people living in Alabama, indicates that it's more like four to five. So for every one case that we've identified, there are roughly four to five other people that may have immunity. On top of that, our vaccinations have been increasing quite rapidly in the last month. So when you add up the total cases, the total immune that didn't test positive and the vaccinations, it looks like we may have a critical threshold for immunity in May or June, which in epidemiologic terms, that's herd immunity. That is a term that we've heard since this time last year. And everybody last year was at this time was like, when are we going to get herd immunity? When are we going to get there? I know most of us didn't expect or want this to take a year or more, but in terms of infectious disease, it seems like that is not that long in, in your speak. Yeah, it's not. It's really not that long from where we are today. A year ago, if we would have said in May of 20 or March of 2020, hey, you've got to wait until May of 2021, it would have been a different story. But now we're close. And basically that herd immunity means that enough people have immunity that the virus won't bounce off as rapidly from person to person, leading to high case numbers, high numbers of hospitalizations and, and really overwhelming the healthcare system. So you talk about this study that uh, came out from Columbia that says that so many more people than we know were originally uh, that had coronavirus and what we have originally tested and that those numbers show the positive test, but they're not an accurate reflection of how many people actually have been infected. Now, based on your you're not your uh, projection of five to one ratio, and that's I know high, but we'll start with that. As of Friday, and this is not taking into account Saturday and Sunday numbers, we had 491,849 positive tests in Alabama. And with that five to one ratio, meaning for every one person that tests positive, there were another five that, uh, that were infected with coronavirus. That would mean 2.4 million Alabamians had already been infected with coronavirus by the end of January. Now, that number, was that surprising to you? And I know that could be a high count, but it's still in your projections in that kind of 2 million area. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was actually surprising um, to, in the back of my head, I had thought about the fact that having that many folks with immunity would be beneficial. Um, but I hadn't really thought about how it projected out to the total Alabama population until we started running the data. And it was surprising how quickly we, we will get there if it's true that that many folks have developed immunity. Now, this herd immunity number that we've been talking about, we know that you say your projections could be May or June. So we can say this summer, early summer, we could get to herd immunity in Alabama. But what exactly does that number mean? What do we need to do to have herd immunity? Herd immunity is just basically where enough people have antibodies or immunity to, to slow the spread of infection. Sometimes we mean um, when we say herd immunity that it keeps the disease out altogether. For example, with measles, if we can get 90% of the population vaccinated, we rarely see a measles outbreak. Now, the herd immunity we're talking about with SARS-CoV-2 is slightly different than measles. We're, we're looking at more like 72% of the population. And again, it's to keep a slow and steady rate of case accumulation, a rate that the hospitals can handle, which gives people the best possible treatment. 
this isn't a number that means no one's going to have COVID. I think that one thing that's important for everyone to know is we're stuck with this now. You know, we really, this is going to be a part of our, our population, just like the flu. It's going to be a regular infection that people get. And some people will get a severe infection and wind up in the hospital. So while it's good news that we're getting closer to being able to open up, it doesn't mean COVID's gone by any stretch of the imagination. So we know that herd immunity is when the majority, we'll say, of, of the population has some sort of antibody, whether that's through vaccination or whether that is through having contracted the virus. But if we're in this kind of two million Alabamians who have, have that immunity in some way, what do we need? What number are we looking for to get to herd immunity? We're shooting for 3.5 million, and that's based on estimates for what we think uh, the level of herd immunity has to be, which is about 72%. If 72% of the population has some level of immunity, we think that will slow the spread of, of SARS-CoV-2 to a manageable level um, for us here in Alabama. So that, I, I know like so many people that just makes you smile, makes you a little bit happy that look, we're, we're getting there, we're so close. But doctor, what exactly, we get to herd immunity, what does that mean in the terms of everyday life? We can put that science speak here, but can I go, can I go to a concert? Can I go to a party later this fall? Can I go to a big wedding? What does that mean for just kind of our day-to-day -day lives? That's the hope. Yeah, that's the hope that we go back to normal once we get comfortable with a certain level of, of immunity. What does that mean in terms of what people are watching? We'd like to see less than five cases per 100,000. So here in Alabama, that's we're still way above that because we're sitting at about 25 cases for, per 100,000. So we need to cut the, the case transmission rate, which vaccination will do that. We also need to see the, the rate of hospitalizations decrease. And if that decreases in terms of the number of people that wind up in the hospital, per case, both of those could allow us to open back up again, like you were talking about, getting back together for weddings and, and social events. Will the mask ever go away? That's a whole nother question. Um, you know, the rates of influenza have been down this year as well. And a lot of people attribute that strictly to the fact that we're wearing masks. So it could be that you'll see some people continuing to wear masks, although I doubt you'll see a society-wide ordinance that everyone has to wear a mask. Got a great question here from Kelly, and I think a lot of people probably have the same question. And she says, if this is true, and say we do reach herd immunity, if I've recovered from the virus and I may be in one of these numbers, these 2.4 million Alabamians, then why do I need to get vaccinated? That's a great question. Um, it's like influenza or the flu. You still need a regular vaccination to maintain high levels of immunity. Your body turns over those antibodies and they last with you for somewhere between six and 12 months, we think. But it's always good to get that booster. Um, and all diseases require different levels of booster. You know, we get our tetanus shots every 10 years. This one looks like it's probably going to be an annual booster just to keep those antibodies up and your immune system functioning highly to, to beat this virus. These these boosters that you talk about, maybe we uh, are getting our, our first vaccines maybe by May. This booster conversation, I know, is a wider conversation. Is that something that our uh, local and national experts are already thinking about in the terms of the next year and the next year? Yeah, they are, especially nationally. CDC, which leads the vaccination campaigns for the country, they've already started thinking about how uh, we'll integrate some type of COVID vaccination protocol, just like we do for, for influenza. There will be regular monitoring, what variants are circulating, how do we make the best vaccine based on known information to keep the population safe? And that's something they've been doing for a long time. So they're very good at it. Is this projection that you have by the early summer of herd immunity, does that depend on a steady and we can say aggressive uh, vaccination effort in the next couple of months? It does. It does. But it's actually more dependent upon those people that um, have immunity but never tested positive. That That's actually the biggest driving factor right now. If, for example, the ratio were one to one, then the vaccinations take over as being the most important driver that get us um, up to herd immunity by the fall. So it really depends on where we are with those, those folks that have antibodies but never tested positive. Um, but still, the vaccinations have to continue. And like the question from Kelly, even folks that had the virus after they've made it their 90 days, they need to get the vaccine to make sure they've got full immune strength against future uh, potential viruses. We have heard from uh, several experts, again, locally and nationally, even some at UAB, that by May, by late April, early May, that anybody who wants a vaccine should be able to get one. Is, the, is what you're seeing in your research, is that still the case? It looks like it is, yeah, especially with Johnson & Johnson. They've been approved now, and that's just a one-shot um, 
shot. You don't have to get the two doses. It does have slightly lower efficacy, but it's it's slightly. This is what we call um, budget dust or statistical. It's just a small amount different. It still protects you from SARS-CoV-2 at a much higher level than never having gotten the shot before. Do you think that with this recent approval of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that you just mentioned, that we're going to get more of those and more people will be able to get those that are not currently able to receive Moderna or Pfizer, maybe based on the refrigeration issues or, or other uh, availability issues? Absolutely. And some people, let's be honest, they they're, don't like shots. They've been afraid of shots since childhood. And for some people, the thought of just getting one shot will be a much easier mental um, something to picture than having to get two shots three or four weeks apart. Now, a question I'm going to shift to quickly, and that's about mutations. That is something that, uh, unfortunately, we might get this good news, and then some of us uh, watch national news and, and hear about all these different mutations coming, and we start thinking, oh, gosh, is this going to be my life forever? Am I going to be in this bubble forever? What do we know about mutations and how that could affect herd immunity? I look at it like influenza. We know that there are mutations with SARS-CoV-2. We've already seen it. Um, so we know it's going to continue to mutate just like influenza does. And this is what the epidemiologists and the virologists are going to have to do. They're going to have to continue monitoring the virus, looking for variants, looking to see if they're more aggressive, um, and then seeing if the vaccines have to be updated with boosters. So to me, this is a part of what good public health does and not something we should be scared of. In fact, some of you may want to consider careers in public health. It looks like we're going to need more and more folks to do that. Well, we know uh, a lot of people are experts nowadays. So <laughs> Dr. Judd, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for just giving us a little bit of good news on this rainy, dreary Monday. Uh, it kind of lets us see the future a little bit, lets us kind of think we're almost there. Absolutely. Uh, I do want to say I have a bunch of people asking questions uh, more targeted towards vaccines, availability, how to get it, ingredients. I will make sure we get somebody on this week that can talk a little bit more specifically about locations uh, and availability per location, how to sign up, etc. So stay tuned for that. And again, Dr. Judd, thank you for this information. And we will look forward to hopefully having your uh, projection come true in just a couple of months. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ivana. Thanks, Dr. Judd. Everybody, thank you so